welcome everybody and this is obviously our second series of the lamb crop webinars where we're looking at maximizing lamb performance so last week we looked at pre-lambing we're taking you on the next step of the journey tonight and we're looking at the first eight weeks next week we will look at eight weeks through into weaning just to com complete the lambs we are funded today by university innovation fund and um, as i say this this series will be available to to watch online and we'll send out any links to that. I'm your chair for this evening. I'm Kirsten Williams and I'm a sheep and beef consultant with SAC and we have got a fantastic lineup of folk to speak to you this evening. And just a reminder why we're doing this, why we're looking at maximising lamb performance, because we've got this lamb losses figure in Scotland of losses between scanning and lambing between 15 and 20 percent. And we're really trying to minimise that. And how we're trying to do that is we're just trying to tell you guys about what research there is out there, what new thinking and give you some practical tips. And in this with tonight, with the three speakers that we've got, we'll hopefully manage to, to hit all three of those aims. So tonight we have got Daniel Stout, who is one of our sheep and grassland specialists, and he's going to speak about grassland and management matters. We've got Jo Connington, one of our researchers, and she's a geneticist, and she's going to be speaking about breeding out mastitis. And then finally, we've got our friendly farmer and Duncan Nellis, and he's going to be speaking about his system and how he's using data um, to help his selection and management. So a really, really good lineup for you this evening. As we did last week, there's going to be an opportunity to ask questions and that you've got a Q&A box at the bottom of your screen and you can just type in any questions to the speakers there. Or if it's easier for you, then you can just use the, the chat. We've also got some ROSA points tonight, so that's for people that are um, a member of the Register of Sheep Advisors. We've got two points, so if anybody would like points that are members, if you can just please email your number, your full name and your postcode to Val, and I can put that details into the, the chat for you as well. So without further ado, I am going to hand over to Daniel, if you would like to share your screen, Daniel and uh, hand over to you to speak about grass and management matters. That's great, thank you very much, Kirsten. Can you, everything correct? Yeah. Grand. No, evening everyone. Uh, I'd like to be asked to speak tonight um, about, I suppose, maximizing land performance in the first eight weeks of the land's life. Uh, first eight weeks, I suppose it's a, it's a time of major change in that land's life in terms of its dietary requirements and the, and the way it metabolizes food. Um, I thought our ultimate aim in that period of time, let me move this box over, there we are, um, is ultimately to try and grow as big a lambs as possible to maximise our lamb performance. Um, we've got industry targets um, sitting at about 20 kilograms um, of lamb live weight at eight weeks. Um, I think ultimately that would have to be in twins. Um, and we'll see tonight, you know, through Duncan and, and other farmers that that's a, an easily achievable target. And if we can get over 300 grams a day to eight weeks, um, we're well in excess of that target. Um, if we take a look at sort of where we're at in this time um, on the graph, uh, we can see on the bottom of the graph, we've got the, the lamb's age, weeks from birth, and we've got the lamb's intake on the left hand side. And what we can see then is in the first three weeks, we've got an animal, the lamb, that is, you know, fully reliant on its mother's milk um, for all its nutritional requirements. And that's energy, protein, but it's also your trace elements and your minerals, um, and also in terms of getting antibodies through for, for its resistance to disease. But then we have this trans transition period where that lamb then transforms from a monogastric into a ruminant animal by about the point of about eight weeks of age. And it's at that point it starts to kind of intake more and more pasture or other feeds that we are providing that lamb, such as creep. Um, but we can see that even by six weeks, although there's a mistake there, it should say fresh weight for pasture, that their intake of pasture milk is roughly the same. Milk is still a much bigger constitution of its overall nutritional requirements. But... From then on, particularly from eight to 12 weeks, that starts to rapidly decline as pasture and the diet and the quality and quantity of that pasture or creep is much more important. Um, I'm going to leave that side and leave that for um, Poppy to cover next week. And I'm going to focus on that on that left hand side, which is the new milk supply. So how can we promote the ewes performance to then subsequently promote the lamb's performance? And we're trying to do that ultimately um, by providing as much quality and quantity of pasture 
to meet those user requirements of forage rather than expensive supplements. We're also trying to do it whilst uh, minimizing the risk um, of youth developing the status. Um, there's some great uh, stats coming out of Warwick University, uh, one of which was they found that a quarter of acute mastitis use uh, were underfed protein during lactation, and that similar number, about a quarter of acute mastitis use, were also underfed energy in that lactation. So that tells us just how important nutrition is during this period to really promote the user's ability um, to milk. Um, there's multiple factors there, including the reduced immunity, but there's also a factor there in terms of with undernutrition becomes the use compromise, and we end up with a compromisation of her ability to milk and milk off her back. We end up with inadequate milk, and we can then end up with over suckling from the lamb, teeth damage, and ultimately cross suckling as well. Um, so it's just really important there to consider the importance of nutrition as well in, the, in terms of the status. In the first eight weeks, I suppose, what are our action points? Um, I was speaking to Duncan last week at a meeting, uh, so I'll talk about what we're going to talk about tonight. And I was saying, well, what do you do in the first eight weeks to really promote lamb performance? And he kind of just said, well, it's simple, just, just put them out on grass. But I think that really does a disservice for how much planning and, and how much monitoring and adapting farmers like Duncan do to really drive lamb performance. And so much of that comes up actually in terms of setting the animal up for success before lambing. And um, so I've made a few points. I'm going to kind of focus on the green elements um, tonight. First one will be setting the year for success. So actually turning out a healthy, well-conditioned view and a lamb full of colostrum so they're really ready to go when they hit that high quality pasture of which we want to have sufficient high quality pasture to turn out on to meet those use requirements um, or supplementation it requires we can monitor that and adapt and um, also tonight I'm going to speak about kind of considering that priority grouping so is there use that would benefit from a bit of priority grazing or priority supplementation just a bit more TLC to really promote lamb performance and finally um, employing adaptive management based on monitoring to maintain what we've set up. Um, so I think, you know, doing management tasks such as grazing or warming or, or silage cutting or, or marking based on the date of the Highland Show or what we did last year really isn't effective management when we know that parasites and, and grass growth vary so much year on year. Um, so we really need to look at, and what Duncan's going to speak a bit about later on, is, you know, the type of measuring that they do in terms of pasture and parasite and, you know, using eight-week weights and data to really drive what they're doing. So first up, in terms of setting the U.S. success, just considering that turning a U out uh, on the target body condition score, which the industry is fairly set now on, should be between three and three and a half body condition score. Maybe not surprising, HDB Challenge Sheep Data, um, which is a really great project. I think if you see any webinars coming out on it, you should absolutely tune in on them. Um, have found this is following U's right through um, their lifespan, um, from from young U's right up to mature U's and, and cull data. Um, they found that if the U is on target body condition score, actually her losing a small amount of body condition score over lactation is actually beneficial for lamb growth rates. What that tells us really is that they, there's, this is a U that has enough fat on her back to metabolize to support her lactation when her energy demands and protein demands are skyrocketing at peak lactation. But adversely, if we have thin U's, so U's that are under body condition score three, so 2.75 or below, what they found is we had body condition scores actually correlated with decreased lamb growth rate. And what's happening there is we have ewes that are ultimately failing to meet their high nutritional requirements, peak lactation. They don't have the back fat to support them. And that means that lamb uh, milk performance is reduced and ultimately lamb growth rates are reduced thereafter. If, however, they found that where um, effective grazing management or effective management is actually managing to succeed in promoting body condition score gain in these ewes, this is actually uh, correlated to increased land growth rates. So really what that tells us, to my mind anyway, if we can have priority groups, if we can look to separate out thin use and support them a bit better, can we actually help them meet the nutritional requirements without compromising more body condition score loss? Um, so that really comes, you know, can we provide them perhaps with priority grazing? So more grass, better quality pasture, perhaps that supplementation or even just by separating thin ewes out or other types of ewe classes out, we can reduce competition because you've got animals in, in you know, similar fettle. They're, they're not, there's less competition there in terms of having dominant ewes that might push in to, to get the food. Um, there's also beef from Lamb New Zealand stat, which really just supports this challenge sheep there, um, where they found that every half a body condition score below three at Lamin um, in ewes was resulted in a 6% decrease in lamb weaning weights. 
So it really just supports the value of having well-conditioned ewes that can milk off the back a bit. Um, the other one that HCB Challenge Sheep is really you know, focused in on, I think, is um, in terms of the challenges really that, that are set up um, for these young ewes of the first time lammers. Um, and what they found there is that young ewes, so either ewe hogs or dimmers that are lambed in for the first time, are actually responsible for about 40% of light lambs. That would be lambs that are less than 17 kilograms at eight weeks. And that really just highlights an opportunity there that if we can look after these ewe lambs better, um, we can gain that bit more performance. And actually what they found uh, looking at ewe lambs at Tuppen is if they were on target at Tuppen, so that's basically 60% of mature weight, they were actually capable of producing 20 kilogram lambs at eight weeks, which again, going back as our industry target. But if they were below target, we were right down at 14.8. And that puts major questions on the financial viability of Tuppen ewe hogs, but also in terms of the big question mark of whether we're going to get that ewe hog back up to Tuppen weight targets for gimmers and that subsequent knock-on effect, um, where they found on target gimmers that 80% of mature weight produced 11% more weaning weight than those that were underweight. And actually, interestingly, they found another 11% benefit of being over target, um, which really just highlights that having well-grown ewe lambs and ewe hogs ready to lamb um, and having the feed resources in front of them over lactation to grow on sufficiently. You know, a ewe lamb needs about 20% more energy and protein during lactation than an adult ewe the same weight because she needs to grow as well. Um, it just really highlights to me the, the opportunity there of, of separating. And I think we'll always do that with ewe lambs, but there's also an opportunity there with gimmers. And particularly we know, such as last season, sorry, last summer, where a lot of people were hit by drought, we've actually got quite a lot of underweight, under target gimmers. Um, and ultimately they're going to need that a little bit more priority, I think, to really get them up to target weights. Um, one opportunity there, perhaps you're not going to weigh them out the shed, but you had an opportunity, particularly at scanning, um, to get some understanding of the weights and where they're at in terms of target. Um, um, another opportunity there as well, to my mind, um, I said about turning out healthy ewes, and I suppose probably the reverse of that is what's the impact of turning out unhealthy ewes um, into groups of healthy ewes? And I think it's something that, you know, I'm, you know I think a lot of us do, um, particularly like two good examples would be um, lameness and also mastitis. Um, if we consider lameness, or food rot in particular, um, there's been some really good studies um, done at Warwick University. Um, with Laura Green and Co. Um, one of the stats they found there was the bacteria for foot rot, which is similar, it was the same for scald and foot rot, um, can actually only survive on pasture for up to 14 days. So actually what that tells us is it's not necessarily the pasture, but it's actually the reserve of the bacteria infected in the infected use that is ultimately um, contaminating the pasture and continuing on that cycle of disease. So at turnout, particularly if we've had, you know, use of foot rot housed over winter, we've got that opportunity to separate ewes with, you know, with issues of mastitis or issues of lameness and reduce that risk to other stock. Um, similarly with mastitis, again, we know we've got higher risk ewes. The challenge sheep showed that gimmers or first time lambs are a much higher risk of mastitis. So having them separate and having them separate from other ewes um, reduces that risk of um, cross suckling and contamination from one ewe to another through bacteria transfer in the lamb's mouth. And so it's just two opportunities we've got. There's a good opportunity where we can just separate use off and try and reduce that burden uh, to other use. Uh, well, the next question, I suppose, is we said about turning use out into sufficient pasture. And then um, just a quick consideration, I suppose, about what our energy requirements are. Um, we heard from Lorna last week about the increasing demand that you has right up to late pregnancy, but actually that is exponentially increased as we go into lactation, um, as shown on the graph. Uh, for twin ewes, that energy requirement it basically increases the day after the second we start lambing, but goes right up to about peak lactation at about three or four weeks in a twin, where she's going to need about 60% more protein, uh, sorry, energy, and about 44% more uh, protein um, than she did at the point of lambing. Um, so it's a huge demand, and it's difficult for that ewe to actually meet that demand, um, which we're going to have a look at now. Um, I thought it was interesting to put some actual numbers to it all. Um, so just run some diets uh, for a twin bearing you. So this is at week four lactation. So peak lactation should be trying to produce about three litres a day of milk. So it's, you know, it's very much like we're trying to feed a dairy cow here. You know, it's a huge demand on the youth 
and you're looking at her needing about 33 megajoules of energy and about 300 grams of protein at that point. What we do know, provided we've got that condition on the ewe, she can comfortably lose in the region of about 100 grams a day. And actually that can take her down to about 29 megajoules of energy and 300 or what less than 300 grams of protein. And actually we consider what sufficient pasture can be. Well, if we've got a high quality spring grass at 12 ME and she can manage to succeed in eating three and a half percent of her own body weight, she eats about 2.5 kilograms of dry matter, which is, you know, it's a, it's a substantial amount of fresh weight of grass. She's actually able to meet all her demands off pasture with that small amount of um, so that small amount of body condition score loss. And we can see actually if she loses a bit more, which often they will during the feet lactation, she can comfortably meet our requirements as long as she's not burdened with the, you know, with the deficit for too long. Um, and what we'll find uh, the studies will show is that ewes can kind of can handle a nutritional deficit, but only really for one or two weeks. And after that, we're going to get a slump in milk yields and that's never going to recover. And that's really what we see in these youths that don't have the body condition score um, to give, that they fail to meet the excessively high demands and ultimately the lambs suffer from that. Um, I thought it was interesting just to put that body condition score loss into perspective. And if she can lose 100 grams a day, it's almost like she's forfeiting about 300 grams of concentrate. So she can fairly top herself up with that body condition. Um, and ultimately, if she loses on average about 100 grams a day over that kind of peak lactation, um, we can look at about half a body condition score, which for a 70 kilogram use probably in the region of four and a half kilograms. Um, finally, what we can see in that table as well is when we've got twins at eight weeks, so that's a two litre um, lactation, so still a fair amount of milk, which is equivalent to a single bearing you or rearing you, sorry, uh, at about four weeks. They're needing about 25 megajoules of energy and about 230 megajoules, uh, grams of protein a day. And what we can see actually is that's well below, well, it is, it is below what they are capable of eating off grass. So it just shows that it's that bit easier um, to meet requirements of single bearing use or rearing use um, off grass. But I did think it was probably worth the point there that that's probably sitting about 3%. So it's a bit of restriction, but it's not a huge amount if you really want to promote performance. Um, so there's just a thought there if we're quite often if we're lambing outdoors, we might need to actually restrict single bearing new intakes because we're scared of um, scared of uh, having lambing difficulties of, of large lambs. So actually, if we're going to do that type of system, we really need to look at you know perhaps maybe a drift lambing system is more appropriate, where once they've lambed, they can maybe get some fresh pasture, where we can then subsequently try and really drive intakes to meet that demand. Um, so what is sufficient pasture? I suppose it's the amount of pasture she needs to actually drive 3.5% of body weight of intake um, in, be able to physically consume that much grass. Um, we know that intakes increase when pasture increases from about two to eight centimetres, and that peaks at about six to nine centimetres. Um, but as a rule of thumb, we're really needing about four centimetres of grass in front of those stock to allow maintaining above four centimetres to allow that ewe to physically consume as much grass as she possibly can to meet her lactation needs. Um, this can sometimes, I think, probably be slightly misconstrued, whereby it's not simply a case of turning ewes out into four centimetres, because they'll eat that right down. We need to have sufficient pasture growth at the same time to maintain that pasture above that, even as the ewes are eating. Um, you can see that on the right-hand side. But what also strikes me is that if we know that peak intakes can actually you know, come at six centimetres, Perhaps if we've got certain fields with slightly better covers, we should be thinking of how can we prioritise those for stock that need to consume that bit more intake, such as perhaps our young ewes or our, our twin bearing young ewes um, or our thin ewes, um, or perhaps even triplet bearing ewes. Um, finally, as well, on that kind of importance of intake, it's not sheer, sheer quantity in front of them, it's also the quality, because as we see, we see it really clearly in silage diets, the higher digestibility of, of the diet. The, more, the quicker the, the rumen flow and the more dry matter that animal could consume. So it's kind of a double whammy. So we really do want pastures to be on that left hand side of those pictures, you know, high quality, you know, 12 plus ME pasture. Um, if it's got clover in it, it's got herbs in it, we've also got a, a further increase in digestibility and intake levels. Um, and we can see that we can achieve this um, if we look on the right hand side um, from Grass Check GB, where so the Scottish average on the Czech farms was 20% crude protein and just short of, of 12 ME grass. Um, so it shows we can we do have a major opportunity here to meet performance of grass. 
um, but it does just take that bit more management um, and, and that monitoring to, to achieve that. I suppose the next question would be, what if I don't have sufficient grass and how much should I feed? Um, you might recognise this is from HDB's Feed in the U, um, where the recommendation is if we're, if, we're, if we're above and we're keeping it in that four or five centimetre mark, we're probably all right not to supplement. But actually, if we're down into the 3.5, that really is just scraping, you know, we're just not quite meeting demands off grass. We can probably look at feeding about 0.4, about a pound a day of concentrate feed. Um, but if we're down any lower than that, say three centimetres, we're really in the stage of needing to pr present quite a substantial amount of feed to those ewes because um, they're not going to be able to achieve those intakes. Um, and any lower, we really need to look at additional forage as well. Um, and it can be quite hard to meet those requirements of conserve type forage um, compared to grass, because actually say we're on sort of high intake, high quality silage, we stomach will only be looking at an intake of about 1.6 kilograms of dry matter. And actually to meet the requirement there, would actually be an additional kilogram of concentrate. So if we can have highly digestible, high quality pasture in front of them, we're better better set to meet those requirements um, of forage alone. Um, there's also a consideration there about if you've got fodder beet or sweets available, um, very roughly about three kilogram of either would be about the equivalent of about half a kilogram of concentrates from an energy perspective, um, not a protein that they are lower quality feeds, but that high energy in them can complement that ruin's ability to get the protein out um, of the pasture. So there's a complementary feed source there. Um, but of course, as we get to more and more forage intake, rather, or less and less rather, we might need to think about additional supplementation with, with protein. Again, and I'm going to let Duncan speak about, you know, focus more on this, but what we need then from there on is adaptive flexible management to keep that pasture in high, you know, in high quality state. And so a leafy state, we're trying to you know, maintain that pasture about four to six centimetres in a sex stock system, um, where we're trying to limit that plant's ability to set stem and produce dead leaf and ultimately build it a poorer quality, quality feed, whereby, I think you might even see this photo next week with Poppy, whereby we've got lambs standing in what is now a lower quality feed, and we're ultimately that's impacting our performance several months down the line if we fail to control that kind of splurge of grass um, in the spring. Um, on a rotational system, we might look at going in at about eight or ten centimetres and coming out about four or five. And finally, just going to look at, I suppose I've said it quite a few times about what, you know, priority pasture, priority grazing. And quite often we think, well, of all my farm's grass, how can I have priority grazing? But there's plenty of opportunities there and um, with a bit of additional management. Um, we might consider about clean grazing. So have we got pasture? That has not had sheep on it last year, and so as has you know, has it got cattle grazed on it last year or silage cut? We'll have a lower um, worm burden demand on that pasture. And um, I think Duncan's got some good stats on that. And um, we've also got uh, considerations about whether we've got a variation in pasture heights throughout the farm. Can we use that to then prioritise for certain groups? We've got a photo there um, of triplet rearing ewes, and you can see they're on a good a good wedge of grass. Um, to really promote their performance and intakes. They might be on a stocking rate that's a bit lower as well, but we do need to consider about whether we can maintain that pasture quality and height um, if we reduce stocking rate too low. Um, and we also might just stock them at lower mob sizes as well to reduce competition. Um, we've also got options there about leader follower, whereby we put one stock class in a field first, allow them to have priority grazing, so eat what they want, be selective, eat the best bits, you know, the clover, the herbs, move on, and then we have another stock class coming in afterwards to just to tidy up and ultimately take the hit, I suppose, in terms of the, the lower nutritional value. But we're promoting that lamb performance in the first group. Um, we might also look to promote the different sword diversity as well um, to look, promote performance there. So thinking about how can we promote clover in our swords, but also perhaps looking at additional uh, sword diversity such as herbal lays. And just before I wrap up, um, just, I thought there's a really there's some really great project work coming out of Ireland. Um, one's called Smart Grass. There's another one called Smart Sward. Um, and they're all looking at how can we you know incorporate more of these multi-species swords or herbal lays and more legumes, more herbs. Um, and what's the impact there? Because there's there's definitely an additional cost to some of these seed mixtures. So where are we going to get the additional benefit there? And um, we've got one example here whereby they've got four different sward types. They've got perennial ryegrass. They've got 
a conventional perennial, that's a pure perennial ryegrass, perennial ryegrass white clover, uh, 6S, which is perennial ryegrass, timothy, white clover, red clover, plantain and chicory. And they've got one they're called 9S, which is the whole lot there. So six plus cock's foot, bird's foot trefoil uh, and a plant called yarrow. And what they've done then is they've on each on each land parcel, they've then rotationally grazed on each one 30 twin rearing ewes and they've mounted performance throughout right to slaughter. And what we can see, which I think is just really promising, is a significant benefit in having this for diversity. I think it's particularly the legumes, to be fair, within these swards. Um, we look at perennial ryegrass going to white clover. By having that inclusion of white clover, you're seeing about a 1.6 kilogram weaning weight benefit there. Um, and actually having looked into the research paper, actually in the dry matter percentage, we're looking at about 10% white clover in the dry matter. So actually we can tell there's opportunity there to actually improve that further, improve that benefit. And that would be the reality on, on so many farms around the country that there's an opportunity to really promote clover and promote, promote performance. What we then see is an additional benefit again uh, to weaning of having those additional species in, in the 6S. And to be fair, it's slightly lower in the 9S, but still superior um, to the, the straight around the ryegrass sward. Again, having looped into the sward composition, although it was established with more legumes and herbs in it, it would appear that in this research project, actually the legume content was lower in the 9S, and perhaps that's having an impact. Um, but perhaps it's probably more interesting than just the straight weaning weight is to look at how average daily gain was split. And what we can see uh, from birth to six weeks, whereby lambs are growing at just short of 300 grams, by promoting that with white clover, we got to 311, but with the 6S, which had the additional you know, plantain chicory red clover in it, we've got a huge jump of 50 grams a head per day. So there's a huge jump, and that jump's not the same when we look at it from birth to weaning. So what we're seeing is that the, a big part of that benefit has come from that early stage, ultimately when it's the used milk that's promoting lamb performance. Um, so what that's really telling us is the, the, the additional benefits um, of these highly digestible, high protein spores are having on the usability um, to really promote her milk yields. Um, there's also some additional interesting ones there, whereby on the herbal type lays, there was a 40% reduction in wormers used in lambs um, to perceived anthelmintic benefits. And ultimately, uh, lambs on the 6S reached slaughter weight 14 days quicker than on the straight ryegrass sward. And that really begs the question then about what, what's the impact on the use um, in this system? And um, what we can see then from this very numbery table um, is We've got ewes lambing down at very similar weights. You know, this is a you know, well done research project. Animals are very much, you know, set, set between, the, between the systems. But if we look down here in the red box, what we can see, fairly conventional, fairly what we've probably already spoken about. We've got ewes on the perennial ryegrass or the white cloverlay losing in the region of four or five kilograms um, of body weight from lambing to weaning. Um, so we go back, that's probably what we were talking about earlier, about 100, averaging 100 grams a day of that lactation period. Pretty conventional, but we then we have a system here where we have to try and regain that body condition score. What we've then got on the 6S and the 9S, interestingly, is the complete reverse, whereby actually use have actually gained weight um, even in that early lactation, that peak lactation period. Um, I think to me that really strikes that how can we utilize these swords then for these priority groups, whereby we've got use that don't have that body condition score to metabolize. I think that's the real value here is using that for those priority groups of those young ewes of those young hogs and um, that are lamb. There's real benefit there to, to boost lamb performance, but also ewe performance as well and set them up better, you know, for the subsequent mate. And we've also got a benefit there in terms of the whole system, um, whereby if we don't have to put condition on those ewes, you know, over over the autumn, we can also restrict their intakes, which frees up more, more grazing for finishing lamb. So there's a multiple to the benefits here. Um, and it is probably worth pointing out these major benefits have also been backed by other by other research projects um, and also some results over in New Zealand. Um, I think there's quite exciting um, and it shows that there's, there's real opportunity there in some of these different kind of more diverse swords. But they do take a bit more management um, and there's lots of considerations about not winter grazing and, you know, how much of your farm would you want to put in them. Um, but certainly benefits and um, we want to utilise it. In conclusion then, I suppose just considering what your priority stock is, 
look to maximise their intakes of high quality pasture, supplement if required. Also consider how can we provide that priority grazing for these priority groups to really promote performance um, and don't turn out lane use and mistake issues in with healthy use. That is me. Brilliant. Thank you very much for that, Daniel. Oodles and oodles of information there for folk. Um, as Jo is bringing up her slides, I will task you with one of the questions that's been submitted for you, Daniel, mm -hmm. and it is around herbal lays. So you spoke about the kind of en entry and exit for rotational grazing of grass. How does that vary with herbal lays and what do you do if it gets away? Yeah, absolutely. So yeah, they're, they're very different plants, particularly to, the, to your grazing, uh, to, your, to your grass. Um, you're very much looking at going in the higher covers. So whereby on a grass system, you'd be looking at going in at sort of eight to 10 centimetres. Otherwise you'd be reducing, you know, you'd be reducing your um, your feed quality long, long term. Um, under these, you're looking at going in at, you know, maybe even 20 centimetres or 15 centimetres. And you're also looking to graze them down, but to a higher residual again. Because if you think about, we've got planting and chicory in particular, it's more like trying to graze a lettuce, you know, where they've got this crown at the bottom and then they've got the leaves at the top. And actually, we don't want to damage that bottom crown. Um, otherwise, we run the risk of, you know, really impacting their long term persistency. And what we've seen with quite a lot of farms where they've gone in uh, with a herbal late and they've just conventionally grazed it, set stocked it, is that the herbs are gone in a year or two and they don't see the point in it. Um, so there is that. There's absolutely there needs to be improved management of these of these herbs and legumes. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Daniel. Uh, we shall move on to Joe next. So Joe is going to speak about breeding out mastitis. Joe, over to you. Thanks very much, Kirsten, and thanks, Daniel, for a really good uh, introduction to uh, to this subject. And uh, I've, I've certainly learned a, a, an awful lot in the past half an hour. So thanks very much for that. But we're changing topic slightly, although Daniel did touch on it uh, throughout his talk, and we're going to uh, hear about um, some of the work that we've been doing on breeding out mastitis in collaboration with others and funded by um, uh, partners uh, at home and, and abroad. So what's the problem? Well, we know that um, if we're breeding animals for high lamb growth, as Daniel has uh, told us we should be doing, that means then the lambs need to have more fuel to be able to do that, which means more milk to grow and, uh, and, and hit the target weights. And some of the ewes that, um, that we have in the, some of the breeding programs um, are having to fuel some daily live weight games of more than half a kilo a day, and that's doubled if they've got twins or even tri or even triplets. So, you know, they're really pumping out the milk for some of these very high performing flocks that are engaging in performance recording and focusing it focusing in on lamb growth rate. And the concerns that we have is because we know that the antagonisms do exist, um, both in, in dairy, sheep and goats, and also cattle. Um, if you're focusing breeding on for, for high milk yields in, 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 um, uh, in, um, in these species, uh, also leads to um, higher levels of mastitis, and it's a, a known antagonism. Um, and um, we've um, looked at, at that from across the board and published a paper on, on some, of the, some of those antagonisms that was published last year. So what did we do? And I say we is a bit of a, um, um, yeah, it's not we, it's the, the Texel Sheep Society have been working with us for a number of years now, and they um, had partner farms to do a lot of measuring of animals. Um, and the animals came from the performance recording um, system and that they have. And so we had information on the animals from their pedigree and also um, we know that the performance, past performance and, and um, uh, an ongoing performance for the years that we were recording the animals. And they looked at uh, animals and measured all sorts of different things um, according to um, the dimensions of the rudder um, and also um, uh, various bits and pieces, which we'll focus in on in a minute. But there were 23 farms across the UK we ended up with around 8,000 records from three and a half, 3.3 thousand animals uh, between 2015 actually and 2021. 
And we took, um, we used something here, which you can see on the left is called a California milk test or California mastitis test. And it's basically a, a paddle and it's, it's old technology. It's been used in the industry for years and years, probably since the 1950s and 60s, where you put some milk in, in those wells and you add some um, essentially posh washing up liquid in there, as you can see by the, see that by the pink. And um, the milk goes very gloopy if it has a high level of somatic cell count. And somatic cell count is what is measured in the lab normally when, when dairy farmers uh, do their milk testing. That goes across the lab and they get um, the, the somatic cell um, count, which essentially um, tells them the level of uh, somatic cells in the milk. And high counts are, mean poor quality. And um, in some cases, people are, are paid based on that cell count. Um, so uh, using that same technology really in, in, um, in, in for meat sheep breeds was relatively novel at the time. Um, but uh, we, we use that technology. There's four little rings. Um, that's because it was developed for dairy cattle, not for sheep with two teats. But anyway. That's a California mastitis test or milk test, or as I refer to as uh, CMT. And on the right hand side um, is a, a, a method to take a DNA sample um, from, the, from the nose of the sheep, which is what we did using a, uh, uh, again, a kind of a posh, a, a posh um, cotton bud up the nose. And as I mentioned, we took uh, lots of dimensions of the udders um, and also uh, looked at um, uh, the, the, the relative, relative um, shape of the udder in relation to other parts of, of the body. We did an awful lot of testing um, and actually um, we, we, we did find out some key messages that I'd like to convey today. First of all, our California milk test was actually a real success. We, we did um, uh, find a very good relationship between cell count and the California milk test. Um, but if, you, if we rely on palpating sheep's udders, um, that was not very indicative of, uh, of animals' uh, mastitis. It might have been indicative of mastitis in the past with the lumps and bumps, but certainly not uh, what was going on um, currently. Um, and as I mentioned, that the, um, there was very high relationship between the somatic cell count and um, the California milk test. And there's two graphs on the screen essentially showing the same information, but um, just in a slightly different format. Um, we had a five point score for the California milk test where a zero was uh, very runny milk when we put the uh, bushing up liquid in there and four is very, very gloopy. And you can see um, on the vertical axis, the very, very high levels of semantic cell count we get for animals from, from um, score four uh, in both of the graphs um, uh, that, that's, that's apparent. So um, the re relationship between the two was, was really very high a correlation of over Point, over 0.9 for, um, for the relationship between California milk test and uh, somatic cell count. So we were very pleased actually that this um, simple technology can be used um, for our milk sheep breeds. And when we did this, um, many farmers actually quite liked using this as a, as a management tool as well, not just for the breeding program. So if they're slightly concerned that there might be um, you know, getting mastitis, uh, a simple, uh, a simple test would, would, would give them some indication of, of whether they were right or not. And what we're looking at here is it's subclinical mastitis. By the time you see mastitis in the sheep, you're too late. So this is really looking at subclinical mastitis levels at key points in the management uh, of your sheep uh, and also particularly for the use in, in breeding programs. We looked to see what the genetic basis of mastitis was, and um, it, it varied actually between seven and 14%, depending on the population that we looked at, which is pretty typical of a disease and fitness traits. Um, and, and that's not unexpected. Some disease traits, you can get up to about 20% um, of the variation that's due to genetics. Um, but in, in this uh, experiment, it was between seven and 14. Certainly um, low, but certainly big enough for us to be able to do something positively um, within a breeding program setup. And this um, graph, this, this, this slide really shows you the prevalence of the animals that we scored according to the different uh, scores that we had. So the blue 
colour is animals that didn't have any mastitis and the other colours uh, of, of animals that did have mastitis um, for, for the different uh, scores that uh, I mentioned earlier. And when you, when you look at them, um, they're, they're much of much must really, but overall, uh, between half and 62% of all the animals that we scored didn't have any um, detectable levels of mastitis. Um, but what that means really is that um, between 11 and 21% had the worst scores. So there is certainly um, an issue that, um, you know, in some breeds, um, it, it really needs to be looked at um, and um, potentially breeding to be used as, a, as, as one of the tools to reduce mastitis in that population. And as I said, one thing you don't really know um, or, or, or recognize is that ewes that have mastitis have poorer quality milk and poorer quality milk results in lower growing lambs, slower growing, slower growing lambs. And what this graph here shows is a, a negative relationship between the, the sum of the California milk test score. So each uh, animal had up to four um, scores. So when you add them together, you get potentially eight. And there's a downward trajectory between, um, between those animals that didn't have any mastitis uh, and those animals um, that did. So I'll see if I can use this uh, spot thing, uh, mouse, oop, no, yeah. Okay, so between animals that had um, uh, no mastitis versus animals that had the worst scores, um, there was, um, oh, here we go. <laughs> There's about 3.8 kilos difference between animals that um, uh, didn't have um, any mastitis compared to those that had the worst scores. And a, a modest uh, a pence per kilogram or, or pounds per kilogram, 172, you can see this was done a little while ago, that equates to about a six pounds 60 difference in the, um, in, in the loss, if you like, of, of live weight gain from animals that had mastitis compared to those that, di that didn't. So really quite a, um, a significant hidden loss um, can be, you know, is, is definitely there for animals with mastitis. So what can we do for this in terms of in a breeding program? Well, um, when we, as I mentioned to you before, we took uh, DNA, DNA samples and the genomic information tells us uh, which variants an animal has a specific location called a SNP, and you can see that down at the bottom there. Um, the technology we have used gives us anything between around 8,000 and 50,000 pieces of in individual information about an animal's genome. And when we link that up to um, the data that we have that, that we measured on mastitis, we can get information about the average increase or decrease in an animal's breeding values for each individual SNP. And if you look at the graph on the left, and the box there, it shows um, the, that the animals inheriting two copies, one from each sire and the dam of genotype that we donate deep BB, have higher breeding values than the um, opposing genotype um, AA, with the uh, animals having one copy each being somewhere intermediate. So that uh, tells us, so if we combine that information with um, conventional um, uh, phenotypic data, so the data we record on the animals and build it in a breeding program that enhances the prediction accuracy in general that we have for the breeding values. So in a typical breeding program, farmers will get estimated breeding values, EBVs, which is an estimate, uh, an estimate of animal's genetic worth with relation to others that are being evaluated with those animals. And we also get accuracies of the breeding values. And basically the accuracy of the breeding value um, tells us the degree of risk um, that we might have um, for making dodgy selection decisions. And the accuracy essentially uh, base, is based on the number of records and also um, the heritability. So when we um, looked at the impact of including genomic information into mastitis, um, into breeding programs for mastitis, uh, we compared the breeding value and the accuracy without genomic information with the breeding values and accuracy with genomic information. And um, Carolina Kasecha, um, who is just finishing her PhD and also um, a colleague of mine, um, has um, uh, recently um, had a paper accepted which shows 
some of the information that we see on the slide here. And what this is, um, is a, a graph which has conventional breeding values along the horizontal axis and um, genomic breeding values on the vertical axis. The red blobs are animals that have phenotypes or records as well as genomic information. And the animals uh, and the, the, the blobs in blue are animals that don't have any records on, um, on, on mastitis. And what you can see, if you, if you look at the um, uh, accuracy of 0.2 there on the conventional axis, the um, uh, increase in accuracy goes way up to around 0.6 in the, in the genomic um, breeding value. So that means that even though animals don't have a record for mastitis, we can certainly increase their accuracy for that trait if we have um, um, uh, knowledge of um, the animals within that population that do have both a genotype and a phenotype. So we're able to give animals genomic breeding values um, even though um, they, they don't necessarily have that uh, phenotype. Now that's, um, that's the same for breeding values as well, but, what, but, but, but the impact uh, that we have here is the, is, the, is the substantial increase that you might get in accuracy at a much uh, earlier time period. And essentially the way it can be used is by looking, plotting the breeding values and using the information to choose the animals that we want. Um, um, we can uh, we plotted them and we can find out which animals are more resistant and which ones are more susceptible um, based on the breeding values that were, were that were um, derived. So some some take home messages then. Um, essentially, we can include host resistance to disease in sheep breeding programs. Heritability is relatively low, but certainly there's plenty of variation to be able to include them. The California milk test is, is cheap and it's easy to use. So it's a, a relatively good um, uh, trait that we can include into breeding programs because of that. Um, we know that the effects of subclinical mastitis are largely hidden um, and that uh, we've, we've shown that there's um, economic costs associated with having slower lamb growth rate, and that is um, significant. Um, and that, um, yeah, I mentioned that mastitis is under low genetic control, but if you don't include mastitis in breeding programs, and this is the key, you are going to see a deterioration in mastitis if you continue to only um, uh, include growth rate uh, in the breeding program and ignore mastitis. Um, and this is a clear message that, um, that needs to be known because we know that the antagonism, the, the biological antagonism that exists between the two. It's not uh, the relationship between the two isn't isn't it one, but it and it, uh, which means that you can improve lamb growth rate as well as improve mastitis resistance um, in in tandem. But you have to be able to m m monitor that mastitis to be able to do that. And that gen genomic selection offers possibility to select more accurately for animals that are resistant to mastitis. Um, <clears throat> mastitis is a difficult trait to measure and therefore genomic selection um, does um, bring certain benefits. Now I should have mentioned at the start that um, the work that we did here involves a lot of people from both the Texel Sheep Society as well as my colleagues SIUC um, and the funding has come from um, uh, EU projects, uh, the UK um, and the greatest participation and acknowledgement should go to the farmers that did all the hard work. And that's me. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you, Joe. Really good to hear such re research has been undertaken because mastitis is such a massive issue within the national flock. So thank you for that. I'm just going to, between um, Duncan getting his screen up, Joe, I've, there's one question that actually came in during your presentation that would probably be quite good just to address just now. And it was somebody asking at which stage of lactation are you carrying out the California milk test. Okay, so um, the, what we did um, initially was look at several different times in the lactation. So we started at um, uh, eight weeks and we also did it um, at later on in the summer, um, closer to the 20 week weighing period. We did it two, uh, I think two or three times in the first couple of years and then quickly realized that the correlation was very high between the scores in successive um, screenings. So we ended up um, both from a 
practical point of view, but also because we knew it was relatively robust, we ended up using the eight week weighing occasion to then take the mastitis uh, um, samples from, uh, sorry, milk samples from, from the ewes. Um, not easy, um, but certainly that, uh, that has worked well. And that's the model that um, um, is, is, is being, um, is being uh, used for the for the milk for the Texel Sheep Society. Great, super. Thank you very much, Joe. And please, folks, remember if you've got any questions for any um, speaker tonight, Daniel, Joe, or Duncan, please do just pop them into the Q and A, and we'll address them when we get to the end of tonight's presentations. So next up, we have got Duncan. So Duncan, we have heard all the research, and now you're going to tell us how you put this into practice and how you use data on your farm. <clears throat> Hello there, folks. Uh, uh, thanks for the invite. Um, there were two pretty good, uh, great presentations beforehand. Like, I mean, I'll, I'll probably be going over some of those same points, but uh, pretty much about how we kind of apply those things um, here and, and how we try and target um, early lamb growth and uh, in our system reduced days to slaughter um, the uh, I, I'm, when I'm often asked about um, about what, what we're try how we're trying to do it it generally just seems to be I, I tend to think I oversimpl well I don't oversimplify it it's about doing the right things well at the right times and so we're very conscious about um, uh, you know, setting up, setting our, our use up well. Uh, though we are a, a totally forage-based system, that the, the sheep, the sheep and the cattle on our place are all uh, PFRA registered. Um, we so we run. I'll give a little bit of background. We run about two thousand performance recorded clean ewes here, and about twenty-five to thirty percent of them we are on the Ram Compare project. And for those who don't know, the Ram Compare project's a commercial progeny test for terminal sires that. Uh, is run with the levy alongside the levy boards to and and the the, the main idea behind it is to uh, produce single EV a single EBV acro across for, for across terminal sales so um, breeding values mean the same across all breeds uh, so we've been involved with that since its inception because we we had a history of data recording here anybody kind of knows me I'm a little. I'm a little bit of a data tragic, though. I can assure you this presentation won't go over your head. Um, so we're just looking for uh, where what what we think we're gain. Hopefully, this is going to move on. Oh. Um, right. My screen isn't moving on. Try uh, unsharing again, Duncan, and then. Nice share again and if that feels i've got it i can bring it up for you right okay um try that i'm going like that will i will i just keep the side screen on it because it's working I'm not yeah go too... for that go yeah. for that so where we, where we look to gain on this is um we have a we have like I say a split flock a split flock and uh, with uh, about twenty five to thirty percent the ewes going to terminal sires. I don't know about other farms, but by the time we get to uh, early summer, we uh, are in a, a sheep and cattle cattle system. We haven't generally sold anything apart from an odd cull ewe uh, for quite a while, so we're, we're kind of usually hanging on for a little bit of cash flow. So we've always sort of uh, try and get. Um, get lambs moving early to generate early cash flow. We also, we're, we're in a very mixed system. Uh, so we'll have some really good arable. We'll work with some uh, organic arable uh, farms and they put in um, leg, high legume lays into their, into their arable rotation. So we get to use but in, on an annual basis, but we we'll also have quite a lot of marginal ground. So if we can get, excuse me, if we can get our lambs moving fast then it also gives us a it gives us a chance to get those early lamb and ewes off that high performance stuff and almost double crop it with our main crop of, of like a, a performance of core of pure cleanse and get the utilize our uh, sort of more marginal ground to for uh, 
maintenance in early season. Um, obviously, buzzword is carbon footprint now. I, I like if, if you can take methane or um, in, increase performance on, on the same system, you're reducing your far carbon footprint. Um, we also, the organic premium in June is usually pretty good and uh, gives us a chance to utilize that. So we um, don't need to um, uh, think about, you know, um, it gives us a chance to, re to um, draw lambs at lower weights if, if the market uh, lets us adjust to that, you know. Plus, I mean, it, it keys in a little bit with last week's presentation as well, with like none of our terminal lambs, well, none of our lambs are castrated and none of the terminal lambs are docked either. So uh, if we can if we can move them through the system quick enough, that just is not a requirement. And I think ongoing, if we want to have the opportunity to still use uh, what effects of mutilation, then we'll have to, when the opportunity arises, I think it's going to be pretty obvious coming the headwinds that we're facing that uh, we should at least try and not use it where we'll have the opportunity to, uh, and also, you know, uh, when you get lambs away quicker, you have fewer treatments, there's less chance of worm challenges, uh, less chance of other mortality issues. So, um, yeah, there's a, there's, we, we, we believe there's a lot of, lot of gains in that um, uh, with, with where we're going. Uh, how we managed to do it first, we try and maintain at least a body condition score of three right the way through, ideally right the way through the ewes life. If, we're, if possible. So nutrition and, ga and grass cover are pretty important. When were you talking about our uh, early lamb and terminal flock? Obviously we're doing them concentrate free. So we'll have to make sure that we make, we do them on red clover silage. We'll have to make sure that we make a red clover silage. It's at least sort of uh, plus 11 ME and hopefully a little bit better. Uh, 11.5 and a sort of around about a 16 protein. And that seems to get the use through to early lactation uh, uh, to point of two lamin. Uh, but the key we find is to get them as soon as we possibly can onto these high performing uh, high leg humilies. The majority of the stuff we're using uh, for our early lamas are, it's pretty much a, a pure red, red or white clover in these arable breaks. Um, we, we try and take the brakes totally off any terminal lambs we're working with as opposed to the, the, the main block of cleanse, which might, you know, go under a little bit more of a challenge as far as parasite control and, and nutrition goes. Uh, so the, so it's, we find it's really important that as soon as those lambs start taking on board forage, even if it's, even if it's just a few days old, that they're getting used to eating, um, eating, really good high quality stuff uh, fairly quickly. Um, some of that in there, what I'm jumping between the two systems a little bit, the main clean flock, the sort of 15, 1,600 that are lambed outside, uh, the things that have an effect are uh, how we're doing outdoor lamb and uh, stocking rates quite important, especially for uh, maintaining new condition score, but also interference of other use and, and obviously we're performance recording, so we can't really, lamb them that tight uh, because because we actually are you know going around and disturbing them a bit which is not i we realize isn't ideal to to probably of paddocks is quite important genetics is obviously fairly important um you know and we i say disturbance try not to disturb them but i totally blow that out of the water by going picking every pair of lambs up and tagging and weighing uh, and mess them up a bit uh well, just go back to genetics on the uh, on the lamb growth. I do believe that the main crux of how, how we we try and achieve this sort of um, twenty five kilo twenty um, eight week weight is by what we feed them. Though that's just a comparison here that like came from Signet about two two lambs, two uh, Hampshire down rams uh, would different scan weights, uh, different scan weight EBVs, and you can see the difference, just a genetic, a genetic difference. So it's a, it's an important, genetics is an important tool in the box. And obviously we're progeny testing an awful lot of lambs uh, and they're, they're single sire mated. So 
you, you know, they, they are going on the same management system with the same, basically the same youth flock. And there is quite often, um, quite a, like quite a genetic variation. And that quite often is more of genetic variation within a breed than between breeds. It's, it's really quite surprising because one of the questions I always get asked is, come on, then what's the best breed? And uh, I'm never going to say that. So like, you're not going to get that out of us if anybody's going to think about putting that in the question and answer. Uh, but there's a, there's a, there is genetic variation is, is quite, it's quite stark. And uh, what is quite apparent as well is that with rams with high accuracy, as you'd like to think, they are quite accurate. And um, we do get quite, you know, we, we, we the data behind them seems to seems to be backed up by our, the, the on farm performance. Um, so we're that, so we're always targeting those sort of things. So we are doing. We're very conscious of the grass covers that go on too. Um, we would possibly go on because because we're like set stock and at quite low stock and densities. So we'd probably go on to lower covers than a lot of people would feel comfortable at because. We're in the main crop we're lambing in uh, mid-April so we're starting to get grass growth so if we go on too high a cover we'll start to get lose quality later you know by the time we're, we're in ability we're, we're at, come to a stage where we can stock up when we're dealing with uh, some of the multi-species swords that Daniel referred to earlier on uh, um, we uh, are really conscious of rotationally grazing them and probably uh, we would not make lambs over select. So we're in a lucky situation. Well, I mean, some people wouldn't say it's lucky to have 200 suckler cows, but uh, we have, uh, we're quite big fans of leader follower on those sort of systems. And then quite an extended rest, sort of hopefully at that time of year, if we're coming off and leaving, like Daniel said, um, higher covers, on the, the multi-species stuff, then um, we'll be looking to leave them for probably at least a month at that time, if we can, if, a, if it's a possibility. Um, on the red clovers, on the arable breaks, good good grassland management, uh, good rotations is a little harder to achieve because they're quite like most of them are 40 miles from home. But we do replicate it here and we can, we can rotate them a bit more, um, a bit more intensively. But uh, we just find that um, there we basically put them onto a field, set stocked in half the field, and and we're basically doing half and half. And it's not very well done, if we're honest. But it's an eighty mile round trip, so we do it as best as we can. Uh, the value we find in this is this is all data, but I think it ref like a little bit of what we got from Joe and I and I was all you know. I was under probably underdoing it here with 160 quid uh, pence per kilo live weight, but those sort of gains come on farm, and it, it relates to nothing if we put them out against 2,000 2, lambs. It, it, what I'm what I think what I mean by when it relates to nothing is we're not increasing our scan, we're not we're not um, increasing our labour. Or uh, or U base or um, improving mortality. Though if we have two thousand lambs and we achieve thirty grams a day better growth rate, then by the time we get to um, uh, fifty six days, like on our farm, like with just that, just because we've done a better job, it's given us five and a half thousand pounds better, bit higher return uh, for. I'm not saying nothing, but like certainly for no investment in food, third, uh, it's a it's a bit of a free shot if you can get that, if you can get if you can gain that gain that sort of of weight uh, weight improvement, uh, and so it's in that kind of weight improve in that kind of improvement would probably be uh, very hard to recover from a market from the market, and certainly it's the only thing that we as farmers can directly influence ourselves. Um, so we're just are very conscious about um, what it, trying to value what these sort of things deliver to us. Um, and it gives us 
a little bit of a, a an idea about our investments uh, and where we'll go. I mean, we we'll use Farm Max just to just to that's just a, a like an idea of the use of the graph uh, to to make sure that we'll have pasture covers going through because obviously we're we're, we're an organic system and so we we can't really our our ability to, for outlets whether it's uh, supplementation or food is is fairly limited so we we'll have to have a good idea about our supply and demand of grass throughout the year this this graph here is just a um uh, like those are measurements and the, the bottom line is our uh, requirement from grazing and throughout that throughout that grazing period as you can see we cut this is april and this is an old graph but it's it's tighter than that this year but this is where we're coming through and uh, so we'll have a demand there that fluctuates throughout the year as our grass growth goes up and then we want standing standing covers to defer graze cows and sheep through the winter because we still have a grazing demand right the way through the winter so i'm fairly conscious about doing that uh, i'll just put up a graph here of these were uh last year's slaughter lambs every every dot is an individual lamb there might be one or two as you come later in that will track back and have two or three weights on them for for the ram compare project we'll have to do a birth weight an eight week weight and a slaughter weight so they will be on there these lines here relate to gain per gain lamb live weight gain so this line here is 300 grams a day this one's 400 grams a day as you can see uh, this one's five, like half a kilo a day so we'll try and get as many above this 400 gram, keep grams a day weight gain on this system as we possibly can and be looking to sort of sell lambs in the high 30s live weight um, and come in. This year they were coming in at just sub 20 kilos uh, on the on the dead weight. And obviously this year with the, with the spring, the spring trade was really good and there was a really good organic premium. So we never had it quite as good as that. The um, the dots relate to different breeds on that on that system as does and those are the average lines. So as you can see, we're coming through this eight to ten weeks here where we're kind of um, averaging above the four hundred grams a day mark on that those nine I think it was nine hundred and sixty in there. Uh, so it, it's not a linear thing. I was talking to Daniel earlier on about it. I mean we had a fantastic uh, season this year. We we're going on very. It was a very dry spring, but um and they had a but but the the clovers that were that were on were clean and um and they grew really well uh this year it was the our eight week average was about 25 kilos last year it was about 23.8 the year before it was 24.5 there is there's obviously seasonal fluctuations but seasonality and um and the job we do has probably a, a greater effect than the actual genetics so the, the 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 spread in the lambs has more of a genetic effect than um that's where where it's seen more and uh, so uh, wherever you are in, wherever you are on that up or down scale genetics plays a major role um so that would that's kind of a, a little bit of a where we try what we're trying to achieve with that early season growth and um, that's about me i think uh, hopefully there's some questions because i know i kind of zipped through that a bit brilliant thank you very much for that duncan there is plenty of questions so don't don't you worry <laughs> i'll maybe just if you go back to your farm mats graph i think it was the the one before there was somebody asking just when you had that one up um, is that an average farm cover of two and a half kilos of dry matter per hectare in June? Uh, no, uh, that is about, uh, yeah, two and a half tonne there in August. I mean, we're kind of, you're kind of starting to lose control. But when it gets to that now, sorry, this is, a, this is an old graph. I just had it on a slide. Now we would be looking to actually take that out of farm max because we kind of lost control of it. And... Um, if you know what I mean, defer, put it in as deferred grass or a stand in here so it would be fed back out as a supplement because we've obviously lost it by then. Once you start to get over about 2,200 now, we would be thinking that uh, 
that would be a bit low. Though we do want high covers going in because we want to graze as much grass, so we want to make as little silage, we want to use as little plastic and as little diesel as we possibly can. So we really want to be taking deferred grass in. And the the real win with def, with winter deferred grazing is uh, post up and use and uh, dry suckler cows. Um, and we're, we're able to, to save a lot, especially on the suckler herd with using farm max to defer grass. And then allocate supplements out. So sometimes sometimes the supplements are standing crop. Uh, it could be um, kale if you if you wanted and stuff like that. But like basically our supplement, we treat uh, deferred grass as a supplement that is deferred out, like let fed out as a ration. And we'll also do bale grazing as well. But we do make, obviously make silage uh, and try and make good quality silage for these early lamb and ewes as well. So that is two and a half tons, kilos per hectare of standing crop. And that is, we are needing uh, around about one and a half tons to uh, maintain what we've got on the grazing platform pretty much throughout the summer. That's what Super. I can do. Super. Um, there is somebody asking, Duncan, something hopefully very timely for just now for people just going into lambing, but when you're performance recording, what are you actually recording at lambing time and how are you recording it? Um, I do it with um, the sires are preloaded. So I do it with a, a farm IT border software. So when, at top and time, the, 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 the size that they use go to are, are put against the Put against those ewes so that uh, as soon as you those you record the lamb against the ewe it, ge it automatically generates a pedigree so that is the first one we're recording in with the ram compare ones we're recording obviously sire sex uh, breed and birth weight uh, and we're doing pretty much the same in the cleanse though we don't get all birth weights with the cleanse Outside, so I mean, we generally get about two thousand birth weights a year uh, out of the three thousand. So it would be something I'd stop doing if I really, if somebody said, "Oh, there's no value on it, please stop doing birth weights," because birth weights are a pain in the backside. There's no doubt about it. Uh, but we we'll hope to deliver. You know, there is a we believe a little bit of a sweet spot on birth weights that uh, we want to hit, and it's a tricky one when people say, "What's." You know what your average birth weight is because it's it's one of those classics where averages can lie because the 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 where birth weights become an issue is on the extremes. So you know, obviously, if you get too heavy or too light, so I mean, we're looking at about a four point nine average birth weight, which is about perfect, but it doesn't actually tell the whole story. So what the lambs the lambs at birth weights that lie on the extremes are where you where those. Uh, problems lie so when you know if you have if you say oh yeah that's all sorted out because you want around about a five kilo birth weight for it you know or just sub 4.8 kilo birth weight for lamb survival that sounds great but obviously on the bell curve it's it's the edge the edges that give us the the problem and then so we're doing sorry i'm digressing there i'm i'm waffling there we do it with this with put the eids in at birth and tag them against their mums then uh, and we would uh, we some, well we usually dock the uh, clean ones clean lambs as well we've got to get to them within about 24 hours uh, because if you leave it too much longer than the start with the outdoor ones the start to get a, a problem to get a hold of you know if you if you so you can't we, we do take a day off in bad weather, but it's uh, but we have to. There's a quite a lot of catching up to do if you do, um, which is um, we haven't had too much of these last few years, uh, which is also a little bit of a shame because you know the quite often you could just have a really nice tootle about on a quad and um, not have to do very much. And but you can't really back off if you're going to do if we're performance recording. Yeah, um, I'd, I quite like it. I'm not saying my entire family do. And I think my kids are beginning to catch on that not everybody does it. So, because <laughs> we always think, well, <laughs> um, but, uh, but there's, I do, 
absolutely think I believe in the value of recording and it's not just the genetic side of it it's what it gives us further down the line you know what the the um the value it gives us uh that we can look at um improved and group improved pastures improved grazing improved parasite management um you know what you do with different management groups uh, in different situations it, it there's a lot a lot comes with recording that uh, falls out of it that you didn't actually ex expect to find. And sometimes it's a bit like, I suppose, I'm not the one, but like a bit like um, uh, theoretical science, you know, you just do it for the sake of it. And then one day, oh, you know, we can look at that. And how much time would you spend then crunching the data that you're getting? Um, quite a lot, but that's, uh, but like, that's just because I like doing it. Um, I would do, um, Oh, that's just me mum tagging up in the background there. Sorry. It's only a few minutes I've right, okay. Yeah, that's so good. Sorry. <laughs> uh, but, uh, like, um, there were, uh, that was really knocked me off the stop there. Um, so quite a bit. I, I do sit down and just look at things quite a lot. It doesn't take a lot of uploading. It We do it on a scion, so you click it on the, onto the dock and, um, and it comes up, uh, it just all goes on the computer. But I, I do spend quite a bit of time looking at it. And we do try and do as much as we can uh, to use the data we've got. Uh, you know, I mean, we've got, a, we've got a, you know, I think half a million data points or something like that. And it, it's actually an irrelevance unless you use them. It's just a lot of work. So, like, we're pretty conscious about whatever we collect, we try and make relevant or try and utilize because it, there's no doubt about it. It's a lot like it records a lot of work, you know. Joe, have you got a point there? Yeah, I was, I was just uh, interested uh, in the point that Duncan meant about the intermediate optimum for survival. And I've got a graph um, that I showed um, uh, a couple of weeks ago uh, for 550 Norwegian farmers, which was actually, I've got it here if you'd like me to show it. If you, yeah. Um, if you were to un unshare your screen, Duncan, and then I'll share mine and see whether, because um, <clears throat> it, it helps to illustrate your point, I think. Um, hopefully, if it'll work. So can you see that? Yes. Oh, yeah. Kind yeah. Of, yeah. So what that is, is um, about 174,000 Scottish wow. blackface uh, birth weights um, from or some work that we did uh, donkeys ago, but it's fairly relevant still. And this is the mortality rate up here. And you can see that the very low live weight ones have much higher mortality, as do the very heavy ones. Yeah. But then there's an intermediate optimum there. So yeah. that illustrates exactly the point that you were that you were put, putting over. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I do think on this farm, about 4.9 is optimum. Uh, mm -hmm. you know so like with our u size uh which sounds you know quite i don't know most people would say that sounds quite big but uh but like when you when you weigh them that i reckon that sort of just sub five kilos seems about optimum for hours um okay talking red clover then duncan there's been quite a few questions around about the red clover and querying if you ever see red gut um, on yows or lambs that are eating the clover and if your yow fertility if you if how you manage the red clover do you keep yows away from it or how are you managing that yeah we, we do keep them away from it i mean i know there's data come in in the last sort of year it's, uh, like sort of saying the red clover doesn't have that effect but we tried it with some well there were we pulled back out of some culls and I think that the work done on the red clover was at a certain inclusion rate, whereas the, most of the red clover we're using is pretty much pure, pure scan. So we're pretty, it certainly affected the scan on these, uh, on the, the ones we did. I mean, there was only 30 and the were used that were going to be sort of like on the borderline culls. So, but um, uh, it certainly affected them. Uh, red gut, Definitely, we've had a problems in the past, though. Though I do think it's sort of one of those things that is a little bit of the performance on it. The performance on it is so high that you kind of 
live with it a little bit though um though the farm where we're working with now puts in um some of the high tannin stuff i think it's um sunfine um as this black medic goes in it uh birds for tre not birds for trefoil and i'm trying to think of the other one there's some of the other herbs going in and touch wood the last sort of few years we haven't had a lot of problems with it though we have had years where um we've done exactly the same on exactly the same swords and uh and we've had red gut and actually we've had red gut because that's pure white clover stands as well we use so we've had red gut on that as well i think it's low fiber and we've tried putting out fiber in the past but um giving them access to it and making and them want to eat it is too entirely different That's a challenge isn't it yeah. daniel have you got a point on that yeah i was just going to come in on what duncan was saying about the trials um because there's some thoughts kind of that a lot of the previous research we've been looking at and what everyone thinks about red clover and the impact on fertility on top and on it is really really old data and a lot of it's from new zealand and it's pure stands and it's old varieties. And there's a thought that some of the new varieties might be lower in these sort of phytoestrogens. Um, but as Duncan says, there's only really been one trial in this country lately. It was in the great UK. I can share it in the in the chat. Um, and from the part here, uh, it was a herbal lay with 17.6% inclusion of red clover. So this is really far away from being a red clover lay. Um, having read this is the whole thing, I'm pretty sure they spoke about a, a benefit of body condition score, which kind of backs up other things that we've seen before in terms of really driving that intakes and the use, the digestibility of clover. Um, where is it? They found a benefit in SCAN, where the SCAN jump up on a control group on the kind of conventional lay from 170, increased to 181. Really? They were quoting a benefit then, if I remember right, part of that might have been that body condition score. But again, this is not in any way a pure standard red clover. But I yeah, think yeah. that more research required. Um, we were at James Drummond's last week and I asked a similar question. He said when he'd done it last couple, he's tried it a couple of times and it's not gone well and he has lost scan on these kind of high clover multi-species ways that he's growing. So, mm -hmm. yeah, question. Yeah, I, like I just want to be careful with it, and and we <laughs> accept that that's the case with it, and uh, and just accept that what uh, what it is is it's something uh, like a really good finishing thing for growing lambs on. So we just accept that uh, we don't and we don't use it for that. Um, I would love to think we could grow more of it because that is the limit. And, that's the limiting factor on why we don't have more red clover. If I'm honest. Um, is that you know we would just start to run out of topping ground? It was, um, but it was interesting what you were saying about putting them on the high legumes as well, uh, because the we definitely expect ewes to gain weight through lactation. You know, like they're not you you put them on uh, this sort of stuff, and like we expect to take them off at a higher condition score, even though they're kind of pumping their lambs on. Uh, it, it it's fantastic stuff. Uh, it's like it like it's not all beer and skittles you know you do have things like red <laughs> and, um and things like that but yeah if we're looking today if we're looking from kind of birth up into eight weeks we've spoken about eight week weaning weights quite a lot and daniel you spoke about 20 kilos being the the target what if we if we try and split it between hill upland and lowland should where should our hill folk be targeting Good question. Uh, it's definitely got to be lower, doesn't it? At the end of the day, it's all driven by the nutrition that you've got in front of them. Um, but certainly earlier on, when it's based on mostly on the use milking ability, you can get pretty good growth rates in, you know, upland swords, you know, and you probably could target that to be fair. Um, but we can certainly see from Duncan that on good lowland high quality swords, you can just completely smash that target. Um, so it's probably a pretty low target to be honest and duncan what did your lambs did you say achieved eight week weights last year um there were that there were the word we had a poor year last year there were oh sorry last year was good you uh, there were about 25.2 the year before was 23 point i think 23.8 
and the year before was 24 point something. So like it, you know, like we're talking, it's not a linear, you can't just, I wonder how, I, I do wonder, you know, but if we're looking at that as an average, we've obviously got ones that are pushing 600 grams at the, at, at eight weeks. And I think that's probably, um, we wouldn't want them to grow. Well, we certainly wouldn't want a, a, a lamb to grow much. Uh, if we were going to retain a lamb for breeding, we want to, wouldn't want it to grow much more than that, simply because mm. when we've had them do that in the past, then they start to outgrow the skeleton a little bit. And, you, you know, uh, you, I think you've got to be careful. So it's it's not such an issue on on terminal lambs all due due for uh, for the works like. But, um, but yeah, I think that's probably a, an upper limit of what we can hope to achieve. Yeah. Right? Yeah, yeah. So they do for welfare reasons, you know. You know what I mean. And not broiler chickens, you know. Mm. Sorry, Daniel. So there's, some, there's some research that I've not got the exact number on me, but essentially, the ewe lamb during her, you know, lamb period grows more than 400 grams a day. That can impact her subsequent lactation when she's a ewe. Mm -hmm. So, and that I feel like, well, the main point of that would actually be about creep feeding. So are you, you know, if you're creep feeding pedigree sheep, are you impacting their ability later on? actually as you see if we can we can do our pasture as well yeah um, yeah i know i i mean i do i do, like we are we do a bit of grass we, i mean we do grass check and we'll do a bit of grassland analysis and and i and i and i'm not knocking anybody creep feeding lambs at all but i think you've got to do it well and target it and and you know because because that, that sort of spring grass certainly certainly the stuff we're putting these uh, these these lambs on to um, if you're feeding them creep you'd be reducing the quality of their diet as opposed to what the uh, grass is analysing at. I mean, it might be suggested there's probably a little bit of a higher too high a protein for them to utilise, which is fair point. But uh, we certainly does never seems to come in as an issue with growth and. Um, uh, like uh, I think the folk had a bit of idea. Like if if if, if people just sort of just took the chance to do an anal a grassland analysis in the spring, and even whenever in the year actually, because even our deferred grass always surprises us uh, about how how you know good a feed it is. Um, you know we we take ewes off grass in mid lactation and put them on here because it's really too good for the the requirement you know they don't need it so if we've got if we've got here or standing here um we might we might take the opportunity to, to feed use that in mid lactation rather than some deferred grass because it's the deferred grass is better than any silage you make usually even in midwinter you know i think that's a really good point there because it's something that people don't frequently do is it and especially the the deferred grass analyzing it and it is it can be amazing what protein yeah. and energy is within that can't it yeah it is quite incredible sometimes yeah and he actually sometimes we're like we're wasting a feeding into use when you've got that opportunity of maintenance in uh, mid-pregnancy mm -hmm. you know sort of well now sort of you know if you get in if you get a sort of five or six weeks after the tubs are out you've got a wee window there haven't you where you can just feed them a little bit yeah especially fit use you can feed them something a little bit less punchy mm -hmm. you know i'm very aware of the time and it passing nine o'clock i just want to fire one last question at you all and i'm going to come to joe first because i'm afraid joe you've been you've had the least questions so i'm going to put you on the, the point i'm afraid but if there was if there was one thing that you would advise people to do from birth to eight weeks what would it be um I would advise them to use uh, selection indices to select your best animals that um, get to where you want them to go to. Obviously, that's going to be my answer, isn't it? Genetics, genetics, <laughs> genetics. Brilliant. And uh, Daniel? Um, I was sort of thinking, you know, we've heard tonight about the opportunity we've got with, you know, with improved grazing and, and grassland management and these kind of higher digestibility, you know, more diverse lays. But actually, I think it's one thing listening to us rabbit on about it but I think sometimes to be convinced you need to see it in the flesh so I think for anyone interested in going down more of that route can agree in different ways uh, I think it's really important to probably join a discussion group or just try and get on farms that are doing it I think when you see it in the flesh 
that's the real level that gives you the confidence to try it out on your own farm. Great point. And Duncan? Um, like I'm more and more convinced that uh, like condition score I use is really important. Um, so I think it's just, you know, certainly not having them uh, suboptimal. Um, you know, I, I, if I if I look at the condition score, if I relate uh, Wayne and Pike condition scores to use, it's very rarely that there's a U A below three really performing. And I used to think that uh, you know that the, if they were milking off their back, then that was a good thing. But I'm not exactly sure that we want to have U's consistently expending, like you know, exhausting themselves to lactate. And then having to drag themselves back up again, uh, like so. I think uh, a pre, like a, a, a de having them in decent nick pre lamin and trying to maintain that uh, that condition would, is is quite important. And oh, hey, there's a lot of things. Uh, clean grazing. There's another one that's a great <laughs> a great thing to get uh, get done. You know, um, good genetic selection. You know, um, yeah. You know, especially for terminal traits, is really important. You know. The list is endless. It'd be lovely yeah, to have yeah, one yeah. thing. I mean, it's, it's, it's sort of one of those incremental game things, isn't it? You know, like you can you can sort of there's a lot of little effects that that does it. That, you know, and plus yeah. you know there's maternal genetics as well on that side as well. And I think you summed it up quite nicely, Duncan, at the start of your talk when you said doing doing the right thing at the right time. And it's it's very true that and it's it's being yeah. reactive to the season and not yeah. not I think it was Daniel had said, not always just having a date that it, this yeah. happens now. We must start rotational grazing now. It's it's doing the right thing for the right time. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I just on that, like I I did think we forget to put that in the point is is actually with, when you're doing when we're doing weighing for the ram compare, sometimes the weight gain comes it comes in before you'd notice, uh, like uh, something like a parasite challenge. So you, you you wonder why these lambs are sort of backed off, you know, 30, 50, 40 grams a day on a different management group. And it's before you actually see it because, because, because you're not measuring it. Uh, historically, we haven't been measuring it. We don't actually see the impact it has. And the, the impact can be, quite significant if you multiply it by per day per lamb over a, a extended period of time the, the the financial impact of them sort of things is 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 really quite significant and no matter how good a stockman you, you, you are you you know there can be a little way down the line before you'll see it with your own eyes you know um yeah. so i do like i i do think that if folk weighed a bit more they'd be amazed what value they extracted from it Brilliant. Thank you very, very much. You have spoken quite a lot about RAM Compare tonight, Duncan, and that leads on nicely to next week's webinar. So next week is the last one of the series, and we're looking at from eight weeks through into weaning. And we've actually got um, three people again. We've got Sam Boone, who is going to speak about growth genetics and looks after the RAM Compare project. So we'll probably hear more about RAM Compare. We've also got Heather Stevenson, who's one of our vets, and she's going to speak about the worms and the worm challenge. And we've also got Poppy Freiter, who is one of our um, sheep and grassland specialists, and she's going to be speaking about management for that key time. So. Thank you, everybody, for joining us tonight. Thank you so much to you three guys for speaking. Three absolutely brilliant talks and so much information in such a very, very short time. And of course, thank you to our funder, who's the University Innovation Fund. So thanks, folks, and hopefully we will see you again next week. Great. Thank you. Thanks, Bye. Kirsten. Bye now. Bye.